ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us in person or virtually on the occasion of the 21st annual Morris and Sheila Bond lecture. Maurice Bond was the honorary custodian of the chapel archives for 30 years, as well as being the first clerk of the records to the House of Lords. Sheila, his wife, was honorary archivist of St George's from 1954 until her death in 1973. We owe an enormous debt of gratitude to both Morris and Sheila for their promotion of the historical studies of St George's. Our speaker tonight is Dr Ewan Roger, a principal medieval record specialist at the National Archives. He specialises in the records of late medieval and Tudor England government, the secular clergy and the central law courts, with a particular interest in aspects of community, social, medical, and material history. His primary expertise is the history and heritage of St. George's College and Chapel in the 15th and early 16th centuries, which formed the subject of his PhD at Royal Holloway, University of London in 2000 and 15, the subject to which he returns in this evening's lecture. Dr. Roger first became interested in the college's history and archival collections after being tipped off by one of his lecturers who told him all about the college's extraordinary surviving medieval archive collection. He has since gone on to research and publish on several aspects of the college's history, supported by the archival staff who follow in the footsteps, of course, of Morris and Sheila Bond. Dr. Rogers' recent work has included writing on the Dean and Canon's role in developing the first state quarantine and social distancing regulations to combat outbreaks of plague in pre-modern England. It sounds very contemporary. Uh, there is, of course, as many of you will know, very much more to say about his continuing interest uh, in St George's and his ongoing research. However, you have come to hear him and not me. So let me invite you and Roger to speak to us now on resilience and transformation, community life at St George's Chapel in the 15th and early 16th centuries. Thank you for that very kind introduction and welcome to all of you here and those joining us online. So tonight I want to take you back over 500 years to St George's Chapel at the end of the 15th century and to give you a glimpse into what you might have seen or experienced had you been sitting in the same place as you are now, but in 1460 rather than 2021. And the first point to note is that if we were sat here in 1460, we probably wouldn't see very much of community life as we would be sat outside in the cold, because this chapel hadn't been built yet. Now that might seem a slightly silly point to start on, um, but actually it's crucial, I think, in how we think about St. George's at this time, because the original, original chapel was much smaller than this grand building we see today. So the original chapel is this area on the right, and of course this grand structure on the left is what we're sat in today. And in many ways, the story of the community that I'll be talking about tonight is the story of this building and how it came to be. But before we look at the chapel in the 15th century, let's first look at its foundation to set a bit of context. So St George's College and Chapel were founded in August 1348 
by Edward III, when a chapel in the lower ward of Windsor Castle, formerly dedicated to St. Edward, was refounded as a new collegiate foundation, now dedicated to the honor of God, the Virgin Mary, and St. George, George the Martyr, and Edward the Confessor. But from the college's earliest days, it was St. George who took the foremost position, as we can see in the common seal of the new foundation on the screen here, which prominently depicts the saint in the forefront. The new foundation took a few years to become fully established, in large part due to the outbreak of the Black Death that same year. But by 1352, a series of statutes and ordinances were created to regulate the composition and governance of St. George's. The new college was to comprise of a warden, later styled dean, and 12 secular canons, with 13 vicars and four clerks to aid them, as well as six choristers and a verger. More unusually, however, and this is something I'll come back to several times throughout this talk, Edward III decided to add an additional charitable element to his new foundation, with provisions for a group of 26 individuals styled as poor knights. This was intended to support men who had fought in the King's Wars in France and had become impoverished in the process, either through injury or capture, providing lodgings and wages to these veterans in return to, for prayers for the royal family and a regular attendance in chapel. This then was the community that I'll be talking about tonight, which remained relatively unchanged from the college's foundation through to the Reformation. I also briefly want to talk about the sources for royal chapels at this time, as throughout my talk tonight, I'm gonna to be dipping in and out of different archival materials from a few different collections. So as a royal free chapel, St. George's was from its foundation, exempt from, from Episcopal oversight. So it was outside the supervision of the local bishop and instead it fell under royal oversight. So high level documents such as royal appointments and officially sanctioned inquiries in times of difficulty can be found in national collections, including our collections at the National Archives, as is the case for other similar royal chapels. At St. George's, however, we also have the other side of the story as recorded in the college's own archives, which I would suggest are relatively unique in terms of what survives. So one of my favorite documents here in Windsor, for example, is the college's attendance register, which for the 15th century survived from the period June 1468 to July 1479. And it's an amazing source of information for the collegiate community. It records daily attendance in chapel at various services, uh, depending on the individual's position within the college. So for the dean and canons, um, who only had to attend one, one principal service per day, they get one entry per day. But other members of the community, such as the poor knights, who had to attend three main services, and the vicars and clerks, who had to attend all eight services each day, um, were recorded in this register with very small uh, circles in the, in the register. I'm not sure how clear they are on the screen, but there are circles there. So what we have here is a high-level archive at the National Archives, charting the appointments, status, and careers of many members of the community, combined with a detailed account of daily movements supplemented by the college's own extensive financial accounts. So it's a bit of a jigsaw to try and piece all this information together. As both archives only ever tell part of the story of medieval Windsor. But what I hope I can do tonight is piece together this puzzle and present you with at least a glimpse into life here in the 15th century. Okay, so moving to the first part of my talk, resilience. While the college's 1352 statutes set out how the college should run, the reality was rather different. Edward III had intended the college would be provided with a substantial endowment worth a thousand pounds per year, but this promised income never materialized in full, leaving the college with only just over 600 pounds of that thousand pounds to fulfill their statutory obligations. Now this obviously is not an ideal situation. And despite several attempts to secure additional endowments from the crown, as in his petition to Richard II from about 1378, the circumstances meant that from the very start, the Dean and Chapter who governed the college community had to establish difficult priorities within their obligations, a balancing act in prioritizing financial concerns. One of the initial targets was Edward III's new poor knights, perhaps understandably, because had Edward's expectations of 26 poor knights been fully realized, the annual cost to the college 
uh, would have been £526 per year for the night attendance alone. That's over half of the college's intended income, even before that had been revised down. And by comparison, the Dean and Canons who ran the college would have received a mere £303 per year, assuming that everyone attends all the services. But rather than simply abandoning their obligations, however, the college seems to have come to an early compromise, where the original plan for 26 nights was unofficially revised to a more affordable number. Only a single night appears to have been appointed in the first instance, and prior to the 1460s, there were never more than three nights present here at any one time, with the number of lodgings or places almost certainly limited by the college to keep costs down. Now, while this was clearly an entirely sensible plan, it was, it was never ratified by the Crown. And we'll see the question of the poor knights that was, was, is one that comes back to haunt the college on a number of occasions in the 15th and 16th centuries. But despite the limited numbers, those who were initially appointed do appear to have been genuine knights who had served in the King's Wars and become impoverished as a result. And the recorded grants often include details of these veterans and the cause of their misfortunes. So William Crawford's appointment in 1443, for example, noted that he had served in France after the first siege of Harfleur, had been taken prisoner several times, and had suffered significant injuries to his hands, feet, and head. Elsewhere among those appointed, we find veterans of Agincourt and other French campaigns, and several knights appointed in consideration of their age and poverty. So while the numbers may have been low, the status of these knights was, in the college's early days at least, as Edward III had intended. Thanks to this compromise and other similar fudges of the college statutes, St George's was able to survive through the second half of the 14th century without too many major incidents, just about balancing the books throughout. But as they moved into the 15th century, things took a turn for the worse, as England faced a widespread economic depression caused by depopulation and plague, among other factors. For a college that was at times living hand to mouth, reliant on their tenants to pay rent in a timely fashion, this was a really dangerous time. And despite efforts to secure new patronage and reform the college's accounting structures, including on one occasion in 1416 where they hire an external consultant to come and have a look at the books, the college's income fell so low that even the previous compromises would not suffice. Budgetary priorities had to be assessed once again. And as is often the case in moments of financial distress, tempers at Windsor rose, particularly between the college officials and the poor knights. Because the poor knights fulfilled one of the college's main functions, the patronage of raw servants. But as lay men who had lived in the real world and fought in war, they were an awkward part of the community at Windsor. And the initial compromises of the 1350s began to fall apart when college finances dried up. In one document in particular, created by the, the Knights as part of an ongoing, ongoing dispute over pay in the 1440s and 50s, the Knights recorded some of the alleged abuse sent their way by certain members of chapter, who were frustrated by the Knights' constant demands for their wages. So some of the quotes given include, some saith, go pike, ye beggar the Knights. Some say to the said Knights, here is no thing founded for you, but as ye live of our arms. Some say, ye shall fare the wars for your complaints and some say they have little joy to be committed of such beggars. Elsewhere in the same document, they alleged that one knight had had to bribe the college's treasurer, two nobles in order, in order to secure part of the money due to him for the previous year. And a statement that two of the knights had been forced to leave the college because of their great poverty, while the third had run out of money to continue his legal suit against the chapter. Tensions would in time die down, even if the college's financial concerns did not. But I think this episode gives an insight into what can go wrong in a community during periods of economic recession. And this was a period of real danger for St. George's, particularly as the college's own status in the region was being challenged by the mid 15th century with a new royal project, Henry VI Foundation of Eton College, taking root just across the River Thames. So by 1460, we have a college in real danger, trying to fulfill overly ambitious expectations, yet faced by ser serious cash flow issues, compromises, and at times, substantial debt. So how do the college try and deal with this? Well, the first step is to try and secure 
as much raw patronage as possible in order to gain further endowments and secure financial stability. But this is by no means an easy process, particularly in a period of civil war, such as the Wars of the Roses, which were taking place at the time. As a royal free chapel, since its foundation, many of the dean and chapter had been prominent royal officials and clergymen with access and knowledge of both the crown and the mechanics of government and the law courts. And with the new king, Edward IV, seizing the throne in 1461, there was an opportunity to reset the college's relationship with its royal benefactor. But this in turn required a bit of a compromise again. Not everyone can be off in high-flying royal jobs. Otherwise, who is going to be here day to day looking after the running of the college and its daily round of prayers? Fortunately, attendance in chapel was an area in which the college statutes were actually quite flexible. Each canon received an annual stipend paid out of a common fund, rather than tied to individual properties as in other institutions. And there were relatively few rules to limit wages if a canon was not resident at Windsor. Their, this annual sum was topped up by daily payments, known as quotidian payments, for each day they were present in chapel. And as such, they had quite a lot of flexibility, keeping high-flying pluralists on the books and thus maintaining the power of their connections at court to lobby on the college's behalf. And they do this quite a lot throughout the period, while simultaneously keeping their wage bills low. Those who were resident, and we can see from the attendance register, that there was a core group of Windsor loyalists who maintained very, very high residency rates and regularly held the college's um, official positions, such as treasurer and steward. Um, and they could maintain the key functions in chapel on a daily basis. Now, as we'll see, this did cause its own problems on occasion, but in times of financial pressure, for the first decade of Edward IV's reign, wages regularly went unpaid, for example. There's almost a full decade worth of unpaid wages on this entry from the 1470s. Um, but when this pressure kicks in, the system works quite well. There was also further flexibility that could be found in the statutes if an enterprising canon looked hard enough. And this had been the case since the early days of the college's history. So it, it had been stated in the statutes that the canons had to attend one of three principal services each day in order to claim their quotidian payments. But no one said how long you had to stay at the service for. Um, so it was recorded in 1378 that the canons turned up in chapel for the shortest amount of time possible and then left to attend to their own business because no one had said how long they had to stay for. But by the late 15th century, if not in fact earlier, we can also find evidence of further flexibility in the attendance register. So in the statutes, it had been laid out that any of the chapter could be absent on authorized occasions, as long as he was working on the college's behalf. Now this was clearly intended so that the college's financial officers, namely the canon steward, could travel to the college's estates, collect rents, perform visitations, and do this kind of daily business. These authorised absences were marked on the register by a small dot next to the circle denoting attendance, and the canon was to be paid as if they were physically present in chapel themselves. Looking at the register for November and December 1470 and early 1471, however, we see the canons once again finding a loophole. So they authorised one canon, Baldwin Hyde, for absence over several days. So the marked section in red here shows his entries for, from the uh, start of December up to the 19th of December with two canceled entries at the end, the 20th and 21st. But what was Hyde doing during his authorized time away from Windsor? Well, interestingly, the dates for Hyde's entries correspond with the dates on which Henry VI's re-adeption parliament was sitting. And I'd like to thank Dr. Hannes Kleinecker for initially bringing this fact to my attention. Because in fact, Hyde had another job at this point as clerk of the parliaments. So what's actually going on here is he's being paid to pursue his other job, presumably because the college wanted to keep an eye on any proceedings which might prove to be against their best interests. Hyde had also been granted paid leave from the college in the previous months, from the 22nd of October to his appointment in November, possibly in anticipation of the parliament. So writs had been issued on the 15th of October summoning parliament 
and Hyde was granted one day of paid leave on that day, or merely just to keep an eye on the re adoption government at Westminster. Once Parliament had been summoned, it appears he was only granted a formal secondment on the days that Parliament was sitting. So he was not paid when it was prorogued between the 20th of December and 18th of January. But he was also not resident at Windsor, so he gets no payments at all for attendance at this period. Presumably, he stays in London. Now, this is one of the really nice examples, which I think demonstrates the benefits of closely linking different archival collections. Um, and it actually allowed Hannes and myself to provide new dates for this particular parliament, to which barely any records survive. Okay, so we have the Dean and Chapter trying their best to be flexible and resilient in the face of economic concerns. But we can also see several more mundane issues facing the college at this time, particularly among the lower levels of the collegiate community. So as I mentioned earlier, while the Dean and Canons had only one entry per day in the attendance register, the attendance of the college's vicars and clerks who formed the choir, along with a group of choristers whose attendance was not noted, was recorded at each of the main liturgical hours of the day over an 11 year period. So that's a huge amount of data that's being collected by these, um, by these officials. And on one particularly dull day back in 2012, I decided to count all of these small circles. And what I found shed some amazing new light on the problems facing the Dean and chapter at this time. So among these groups, we can see the overall rate of attendance was quite good, fluctuating mainly between 70% and 90% each month. And the choir could and did continue to function when there were vacant positions, when the vicars who were present appear to have made more of an effort to attend chapel to make up the gap. Beyond assessing average attendance, however, I was also able to go deeper and analyze absence from specific services. So for the vicars, for example, there were 12,121 individual absences over the 11 years, while the clerks missed 5,374 individual services. And this is discounting days where they were absent for the whole day. This is only part of the day they're missing. So looking at the chart displayed here, if we start at the top and work our way clockwise round, we have the start of the day at the top, um, and that's the progress of the day. And what it shows is that both groups were prone to sleeping in. So amongst the vicars, 61% of all absences were in the first half of the day, and 39% in the second half. While among the clerks, this rose to 63% absence in the first half of the day, and 37 in the second half. Now, this was not a completely unique occurrence among ecclesiastical communities. The canons of St. Mary Newark in Leicester had been castigated, for example, in 1440, as they did not rise from Matans according to the statutes. And they say, I know how much I shall lose. I had rather lose it than get up, for which the dean did not punish them. So for context, the medieval day at Windsor began around daybreak in the summer and two hours before in winter, with the first two canonical hours of the day taking place, place between about 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. So I have sympathy for them. Um, and these were followed by a series of masses and the following pairs of hours between about 9 and 10, when high mass was celebrated. Then the next round would, be, would finish around midday, after which the canons would return to their lodgings for breakfast, and then they'd regroup in the afternoon for the final two canonical hours of the day. So we are looking at a very early um, start to the day here, which does make sense. Now, this is obviously a very minor disciplinary issue in comparison to some of the others which were experienced. But interestingly, it doesn't seem to have been tolerated by chapter. And we can see what appear to be regular spikes of absenteeism over time, followed by low points. So these occur fairly regularly at about three year periods, and they may show cycles of reform and decline as the Dean and Canons clamp down on absenteeism every few years. I should note as well that this wasn't a problem that just confined to the Vickers and Clarks. So one of the poor knights, John Breton, had been castigated in 1378 for turning up to chapel late and too delicately. And when he knelt to pray, he promptly fell asleep. Elsewhere, we find other evidence of bad behavior in the college's own accounts, as the register isn't just about attendance, it also details those admitted to the college, those dismissed and those disciplined. So in the 11 years covered, 170 fines were recorded, 
along with 25 warnings and 33 dismissals, most of which are for the college's vicars. Now, John Roger was one of these, and he's no relation as far as I'm aware. Um, and John Newman was also uh, one of these. And they were called in on the 21st of January, 1475 for brawling and causing con uh, contention. Newman's time at St. George's had been short and troubled, and he was appointed on the 22nd of October, 1474, clearly taking a dislike to Roger shortly afterwards. So in the aftermath of their quarrel in January, 1475, both men were fined. And by March, Newman was in trouble again, receiving a second warning for fighting. April saw yet more fighting, as Roger was once again summoned to Dean and Chapter for brawling. And shortly, otherwise, shortly after, on the 11th of April, Newman was back for his third warning, third and final warning for fighting someone else. Now, it's uncertain whether Roger was involved in all of these or just some of them, but they, Roger was fined once again, so he may have had some part in it. Um, Newman, his, his kind of rival in this, left the college shortly afterwards in June 1475, probably leaving before he was kicked out by the chapter. Um, and interestingly, these disputes often correspond to these spikes in absenteeism, as was the case in 1475, indicating a period of declining discipline amongst the vicars more generally. And it may have had a hand in sparking brawls, particularly the vicars had been spending time away from chapel in the tavern. We do have some entries that talk about tavern fights in Windsor. Apparently they didn't, didn't get on with some of the town folk. Um, John Roger does not appear to have given up his troublesome ways as he was called before the Dean and Chapters yet again the final year, the following year, um, and was given an ultimatum this time. He had until the 1st of May, 1476, to address the concerns and stop fighting. Um, but he didn't remain at the college much longer after that. He was dismissed on the 1st of June, having essentially hidden in, through most of May. He turns up to chapel, he misses 21 full days in chapel. Um, so he's clearly hiding away. And when he comes back, he's dismissed. And there's a lovely note in the attendance register you can see at the bottom right here. Um, the canon compiling the, the, re the register this month um, put a little note at the end saying this was merited, um, which I think looking at the records seems justified. So what are we to make of all of this ill discipline? Well, I think it's clear that bad behavior was not tolerated by either the Dean and chapter or the college's ultimate head, the King. But at the same time, it doesn't go away. Miscreants were fined, warned and dismissed, yet bad behavior continues. And this discipline was focused heavily on the priestly vicars who were subject to the vows of chastity and obedience that the clerks were not because they were laymen, they could have families, they could work in a secular world. Um, and only one clerk was dismissed in this entire 11 year period. So it's clear in my mind who Dean and Chapter are kind of focusing their attentions on here. Additionally, there is some evidence that all was not well among the Dean and Chapter at this time, particularly around the question of where the power to impose discipline at Windsor lay. It was, of course, intended in the statutes that this power would lie with the dean as head of the college. But there was now also a second power base focused around the group of resident canons I mentioned earlier, who often controlled the college's finances as well. And on some occasions, they actually represented a direct challenge to the authority of the dean. So on several occasions, one of the senior canons would stand in for the dean while he was absent. Um, and the role of this group in controlling discipline raises an interesting question about personal clashes within the community. So this issue is one which largely remains concealed from us, but was alleged by one of the vicars, William Stevens, who had been dismissed prior to the beginning of the attendance register, but who wrote to Edward IV complaining that he'd been expelled by the excitation of certain persons who had moved the dean to dismiss him against the intent of the other canons. His claim does seem to have been unfounded as he was re-admitted, but was once again kicked out not long after. But another allegation from earlier in the century does hint at this similar problem. So this is an accusation made by the poor knights, primarily complaining about financial machinations among the officials at Windsor, but which also states that one of the canons had nicknamed himself Cobb, a name often linked to ringleaders and troublemakers. And the rest of the canons would go to him for advice and guidance in matters pertaining to the college's interests rather than to the dean. So when the dean told him the name Cobb was not convenient to a man of holy church, but rather to a ringleader and maintainer of misdoers, 
and counseled the said canon that was so named among his fellow canons to leave the rule of that name Cobb. Cobb pressed to the, uh, quote here, Cobb pressed to the said Dean face to face as he would have bitten off his nose, saying, if I be called Cobb, I shall make thee hob, forcing the Dean to back down. So we can see here that the chaps themselves were perhaps not always as disciplined as they should have been. And the intended power balances as planned in the statutes were not in place, even if in most of these occasions, the same officials clearly had the college's best interests at heart. So as we've seen so far, St. George's faced several concerns throughout the first years of Edward IV's reign, from the real danger of financial ruin through to the everyday community disputes often exacerbated by unpaid wages and the fine balancing act of trying to satisfy statutory responsibilities without a full endowment, which had existed since the college's foundation. But the community had endured this difficult period, largely through the efforts of a core group of resident canons, flexing the rules where necessary and maintaining discipline for the most part. Now they would benefit from significant royal patronage and begin a slow process of transformation into the grand institution we see around us today. So from as early as 1473, having finally defeated and murdered his rival, Henry VI, Edward IV seems to have been contemplating the transformation of St. George's into a grand new Yorkist foundation. And in order to do so, he needed new endowments. So one of the main grants to secure the college's financial situation was St. Anthony's Hospital in London which was promised to St. George's in 1474, and which among other grants would restore the college's total income to over 1,000 pounds per year, allowing old arrears to be paid, and crucially an annual surplus, which allowed vital reserves to be built up once again. The chapter, however, were, were not keen to simply revert back to their original intended foundation. So there was no attempt to install new poor knights, for example, to reach the intended number of 26. Rather, the focus was once again on singing men, prioritizing the new musical fashion of polyphony over their statutory obligations. The money from St. Anthony's was therefore set aside for the choir, as we can see from the titles of some of the newly appointed clerks who are named as clerks of the new foundation. But alongside a new endowment, Edward also set in place plans for a grand new chapel, the building we're sat in today. Having appointed Richard Beecham, the Bishop of Salisbury as the man to oversee these works, uh, the work began in earnest in 1475, when many of the old buildings in the north and west of the lower ward of the castle were cleared to make space for the new collegiate buildings. Interestingly, while this new building work was obviously a major positive for the college, the year 1475, when dem demolition works were taking place, also corresponds to that year, one of the worst years for ill discipline in the college, quite possibly because of the disruption caused by demolition and possibly because the vicar's hall may have been out of action, leading the vicars to seek meals outside of the college um, buildings. Importantly for St. George's, all the costs of this new building program were met by the exchequer and the accounts provide details about each stage of the early works through to early 1484. They include, for example, this payment here for carved images of St. George and the Dragon, among other figures, which I think relate to this original carving, uh, which is now held in the archives here. Grand new building works at St. George's brought the promise of further endowments as well. The new chapel built on a far grander scale than Edward III's building was intended as, as a center of Yorkist commemoration in which Edward IV himself was to be buried and was therefore also an attractive option for the commemoration of his courtiers. So between 1478 and 1504, as a new chapel was still being built, the number of anniversaries founded within the college rose dramatically uh, from 33 in the 1470s to 57 by the end of uh, 1504. Several of these were for Edward's immediate family and courtiers, including his father, Richard Duke, of York, <coughs> Richard Duke of York, for whom an anniversary first appears in 1478, almost two decades after his death. These new foundations, alongside an increase in the number of chantry foundations in which individual priests would say private masses for the dead, allowed the college to both demonstrate their liturgical prowess, 
particularly as these commemorative services became increasingly elaborate at the end of the 15th century, involving more and more of the collegiate community. And, and it also allowed them to demonstrate their new status, further promoting the college as a prime location for post-mortem commemoration. Linked to this was a move to consolidate the chapel's collection of holy relics, which Edward seems to have embraced, both gifting new items to the college and simultaneously restoring old relics. So in an account of relics dating from 1534, for example, we find an entry for St. George's skull set in gold, standing upon white lions in emerald, garnished with pearl and rich stone, bearing an ostrich feather and one great pearl of the gift of King Edward IV. Now, interestingly, the relic itself was not a gift from Edward. It had actually been given to the college many years previously. But what he's doing is designing and creating and gifting a grand new golden reliquary to house this relic and this, this small piece of skull. As with other post-mortem commemoration, it wasn't just royalty who wanted to be associated with the chapel in this way. Later in the 16th century, for example, we find a relic of a thorn from the crown of Christ, appearing first in an inventory of Thomas Boucher, the constable of Windsor Castle, compiled as part of a legal case, but turning up later in the same 1534 relic list. And I'd like to thank Dr. Linda Clark, who's here tonight, for bringing this entry to my attention. As well as encouraging such grants and commemorations to be founded in their new chapel, the college also sought to consolidate some of their most precious relics in the southeast corner of the chapel. Known as Pilgrim's Corner, this, cons this consolidation would have both made the pilgrims and relics more prominent within the chapel, but also allowed the college to keep an eye on them, and more importantly, perhaps, their donations, including the construction of a small peephole window, uh, which looks down on that corner of the chapel, a medieval form of CCTV. And in that same corner, we find a roof boss depicting Edward IV and Richard Beecham, um, who by 1477 was also the dean of the college, on either side of the college's chief relic, the Cross Gennef, which is allegedly part of the true cross which had been granted to the college at its foundation. In 1478, we find further evidence of this consolidation when the remains of John Sean, a Buckinghamshire man revered by many after his death as a saint, were moved to this corner of the new chapel, then still in the earliest days of its construction. Most importantly for the college, however, was a substantial victory gained in January 1483, when they secured a confirmation in Parliament that they were no longer required to support the poor knights, who were instead to be provided for with a new royal endowment, although remaining within the college community. Now, this was crucial, as despite the fact they had never installed more than three knights at any one point, the threat of having to potentially support 26 knights with the huge costs associated meant that the college's newfound financial security could be lost at any time. And indeed, this move was probably sparked by a flurry of appointments by Edward IV in the previous year, even if only one of those appointed ever actually took up his place at Windsor. So we've had transformation part one, um, but at this point in the college's history, the community was flying high with a full endowment, no poor knights to worry about, and a grand new chapel in progress, which was already filling up with new commemorative foundations and relics to further supplement the college. But within only a few months, they would suffer a major setback, the death of their patron, Edward IV, which would throw the whole project into uncertainty yet again. For the poor knights, there was also an added concern, given that Edward had promised to provide a new endowment for their support, but hadn't done this before he died. So they now existed in limbo, unsupported by the college, yet lacking any real endowment of their own. And unfortunately for the college, while Windsor was very much his brother's project, the new king, Richard III, seems to have been utterly disinterested in Windsor, the college, or indeed the Order of the Garter housed there. And on one occasion actually seems to have left Windsor shortly before St. George's Day, a pointed statement which simply reflects interest in other rural residences. More worrying for St. George's, however, he also paused the ongoing construction of the chapel. So by Edward's death, the new choir was nearly ready for use with temporary structures in some areas, although by no means complete. And work on the chapel seems to have continued into January 1484, but much of the new chapel, including the entire nave, was 
barely, barely built. It was built up to the height of the bottom of the windows in here. So it would have been completely open the rest of it. Now, the situation wasn't as serious as in previous years, given Edward IV's new endowments had removed some of the, the financial precarity of the first half of the 15th century. But new patronage was required and the college appeared to have taken steps themselves now to proactively resolve this. So despite Richard III's disinterest, or indeed perhaps spurred by it, the college actually managed to secure one of their biggest coups at this point, the relocation of the remains of Henry VI to the Pilgrim's Corner at Windsor. So shortly after his death in 1471, Henry's body had become a popular site for pilgrimage and several miracles were reported at his tomb. Located just down the Thames from Windsor at Chertsey Abbey, the site represented both a threat to the college's ambitions as a centre for pilgrimage and an opportunity. And in 1484, they secured possession of his body. Now, while we find no record of this relocation in the central records of government, if we look at the college's own records, we do find details of this move. A payment of five pounds, 10 shillings and a quarter pence for the move itself, plus 54 shillings, eight pence for his reburial, and 13 pounds, six shillings and eight pence for the Dean's expenses and payments for negotiations on the college's behalf this year. Now, frustratingly, the reasons for these negotiations are not given. Um, the Dean's involvement, however, is striking, I would say. And the college at this time were very much focused on lobbying efforts at various centers of governments. But in 1484, the Dean is not just the Dean, He's a very, very close confidant of the new king, Richard III. Um, and he'd actually be, he'd be kicked out in 1485 when Richard loses his life and his throne. But he was also backed up, I think, by a core group at Windsor who had the college's long-term prospects in mind. Henry's tomb, located across the choir from his old rival, Edward IV, would in the coming years prove to be a major site for pilgrimage. So this is a very shrewd move from the college in 1484, seeking further opportunities to consolidate their future. And we see lots of records relating to pilgrims visiting the new shrine, including pilgrim badges, of which 500 have been found for Henry in London alone. And the shrine and linked altar would become heavily decorated with jewels and riches as his cult developed in the new chapel. But we'll come back to Henry in just a second, because in 1485, a very different Henry enters our story and turns the college, college's situation on its head once again. So with the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485 and the death of Richard III in battle, the college were once again faced by the new king, Henry VII. This time, however, they were also faced with a second problem because at Henry's first parliament, a petition was put forward, which seems to have caught the college off guard. A petition from the poor knights attempting to reverse the decision of 1483, which they claimed had been made without their knowledge or consent. So the college immediately prepared to counter the knights and records in both archives lay out some of the arguments that were put forward and defended on both sides. What stands out from these records, however, is the efficiency and depth of the Dean and Chapter's lobbying efforts and moves to secure access to both the, the relevant officials within Parliament um, and various officials around government. So payments were made to secure, um, were made to the speaker, as well as to the porter of the parliament house and other officials, and to MPs and those speaking in the Lord to support their case. Even those who the college had retained for many years received extra gifts in addition to their usual expenses this year. So Thomas Bayon, for example, was treated to breakfast at the college's expense, and he's the underclerk of the parliament. In addition to these payments, the Dean and Canons themselves utilised their own royal connections at court to lobby the King directly and to bend the royal ear while out riding, in addition to a small gift of £100 for Henry's royal favour. Their efforts were successful and the poor knight's petition was refused, but Henry was to have the last laugh in the end, and he shows himself to be far shrewder in his approach to the poor knights than his predecessors. Because in the college's accounts of 1485 to 6, so not long after that parliament has taken place, we find a note stating that Henry had asked the college to resume payments to three knights, just as a favour to himself, until he could make provision to do so himself. But of course, he never provides that grant. 
And indeed, I do wonder whether this was a, a limited compromise that was thrashed out during those parliamentary discussions of 1485, leaving the college with a limited level of support for these knights, but falling short of a legal requirement to fulfill 26 places, for example. In buying time in this way as well, he was able to re-establish the uneasy balance between the college and the knights, which had endured for the previous decades. And he was able to re-establish a useful form of royal patronage in the process. So now we move to the final part of my talk, transformation once again. In the years after Bosworth Field and the rise of Henry VII, the new chapel at Windsor remained abandoned. But in 1492, with the appointment of a key Tudor associate, Christopher Erswick, as a canon, we see work slowly beginning again. Although initially, these were limited to repair works to keep out the rain. So one particular leak was damaging an image of Our Lady, while pigeons had also found their way into the chapel. With a new Lancastrian king on the throne, however, the college now also made a real push to promote Henry VI's tomb and to seek his canonization as Saint Henry, recording the miracles which were reported at the site in English in a book kept at the shrine, over 300 of them allegedly. But under the leadership of Dean Morgan and Canon Oliver King, the college actually took this a step further and commissioned a Latin copy of selected miracles to be assessed for the process of canonization. And what I love about Henry's miracles is how relatively minor some of them are. There are a few big miracles. So in one, on one occasion, there's a the resurrection of a woman who had died from the plague, much to the surprise of the priest who is in the process of burying her at the time. Um, but my favorite ones involve children putting things up their nose and in their ears. As the monastic commentator noted, as is a way of such things, he must put it in his mouth. Children love nothing better than swallowing things. So Miles Freebridge, for example, who was just nine months old, was being carried in the arms of an older boy, and he'd been given a silver pilgrimage badge of St. Thomas of Canterbury to hold, but decided to swallow it instead. Three-year-old Thomas Garrett did the same with a brass pin, while one Richard Dennis had stuck a bean in his ear when a child, and it remained there for 37 years until Henry intervened. Miracles we might not perhaps associate with this pious figure who everyone's praying to involve sporting accidents. So one miracle involves some boys practicing their archery, although one took an uncertain aim and hit a near nearby four-year-old boy in the right eye. Bit more serious, that one. Um, but he, he made it through, that's why he was recorded. Um, more entertainingly, perhaps, is the accident where one William Bartram was injured, um, he was kicked in the genitals while playing football, which gave the commentator the opportunity to voice his complaints about football, saying it was a game in which high-spirited youths of the peasant class propel a large ball, not throwing it in the air, but rolling it along the ground, and not even striking and turning it with their hands, but using their feet. A game that is altogether detestable, and certainly, to my own way of thinking, of all the games, the most barbaric, low and vile, and one that seldom ends without some injury, mishap, or other mischief to the players. You get the sense he really wasn't a fan. <laughs> so Henry was never canonized, despite the recording of these miracles, but attempts, although with regular delays due to the long processes involved and the death of popes at inconvenient times, uh, this process continues into the 16th century, with the last effort to canonize him made in 1528. But I think we can see the recording and the manipulation of these miracles in the 1480s and 90s to try and secure canonization as yet another effort by the collegiate community to try and consolidate their position for the future. Around 1496, Henry VII began to develop his own plans for his own tomb and burial site at Windsor. Selecting the college's original 14th century chapel, so that's the one that's now um, the Albert Memorial Chapel at the back. Um, selecting that site as a site of his new lady chapel where he would be buried, he also made plans for Henry VI's remains to be moved to this new site. So his first step is to demolish that entire chapel, which was entirely functional, um, which left the college community left with only Edward IV's partially built chapel, which hadn't yet been completed. 
Um, so they're left with not one, but two unfinished chapels to try and, and work in. And indeed, the college accounts on this point are a bit confusing about which is the old chapel and which is the new one when repair works are being done. Beyond this annoyance, however, there was a much bigger concern for the college community, however, as proposals to move Henry VI's body to the new Lady Chapel had stirred new claims for possession of the body, probably because the move to Windsor had shown how lucrative such a move could be. So this kicks off into a huge legal dispute with the Abbey and monks at Chertsey complaining that the body had not been given up willingly in the first place, claiming that Richard III had removed them without authority. And that's, that, that's the only evidence we have for Richard's involvement in this. And I think it's very much led by Windsor and St George's rather than Richard III himself. Um, and the college here countered with an argument that the Abbey had been involved and that actually helps them to take the body out and move it. More importantly, perhaps, was the claim by Westminster Abbey that you can see on the screen here, um, that Henry had originally chosen to be buried there himself and had even selected the exact spot for his tomb. So various elderly members of the Abbey community were brought forward to prove that this had taken place and provide witness statements. And while they couldn't agree on when this had taken place, the evidence was enough to convince Henry VII, who announced that his uncle's remains and indeed his own tomb at Windsor was to be moved to Westminster. So having demolished the chapel and left them in kind of purgatory of half finished buildings, he decides he's gonna go somewhere else now in the end anyway. But the proposed move, despite substantial claims pledged by Westminster Abbey for the costs and permissions being secured by the Pope from the Pope never takes place. So with Henry VII's death in 1509, the project ultimately stalled. And by the time of his son's last will and testament, uh, the matter had been abandoned completely, with provisions instead for the tombs of Henry VI and Edward IV to be made more princely in the same places where they now be. And if you go into the choir in, on future visits, you can still see the two tombs there today on either side of the choir. Now, the difficulties around the Lady Chapel problem and rebuilding alongside Henry VII's decision to move his own tomb to Westminster may have spurred the college into action as they sought new patronage to secure the college's future. Rather than relying on royal patronage this time, it seems that Dean Urswick instead sought patronage from his close friend, Reginald, Reginald, <coughs> Reginald Bray, who had himself acted as one of the college's trusted agents in previous years. And in 1503, Bray included provisions in his will for the completion of the chapel, although the final touch would actually come a few years later, while also founding a chantry in the same chapel. And throughout Windsor, uh, throughout St George's Chapel today, you can still see his rebus of a hemp bray on the screen here throughout the stonework and metalwork from this period. I think there are 170 in total. I was looking earlier, you can see one just at the top on the end there, and there's a few more along, one just up there as well. So lots of those to, to kind of show who it was that had finished this chapel. And the college would see one last final transformation in the 16th century, resolving at long last the problem of the poor knights. After almost two centuries of difficulty and compromise, the new dotation, a gift of almost 600 pounds in return for prayers and commemorative services granted in Henry VIII's will, provided at long last a new foundation for the poor knights, in which their numbers were reduced, but which also provide for the first time a proper endowment to support them, much as his grandfather Edward IV had promised some 60 years earlier, but never completed. It would fall to Henry's daughters to put this new administration into practice during their reigns, but for the first time in the college's history, the question of the poor knight's role within the community had been resolved. So to conclude, through the trials of the 15th century, from unpaid wages to unruly vicars, to the transformative, if long-winded, process of refoundation and rebuilding, the members of the medieval collegiate community here were both resilient and dedicated. And through the turmoils of civil war, royal changes of mind, and economic recession, they often had to be. Through their actions, however, they were able to develop and nurture established patronage, patronage networks, both royal and noble, 
They were able to develop and, and nurture a new attractive commemorative and pilgrimage function and fiscal security. And perhaps most importantly, fiscal independence from the crown, which would lead to this grand new institution and building which we see today. Thank you very much. <laughs>